I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. John Elton, from, um, who is the Assistant Director for Survey and Methodology um, at the U.S. Census Bureau. And before that, um, Dr. Elting was uh, the Associate Commissioner for Survey Methods Research at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And earlier, uh, where earlier he had been also a senior, uh, senior mathematical statistician. Um, even before that, he had uh, he got his he, he had received a tenure as, and he was an associate professor at the University um, of Texas uh, Texas A and M Texas A and M and uh, in the Department of Statistics. Um, so he has a long and distinguished career as a statistician and as a researcher. Uh, he's uh, he got his PhD from uh, Iowa State University. Uh, and uh, now he is a fellow of the American Statistical Association, where he also received several awards. Um, he has received the Founders Award, the Roger Harriet Award for Innovation in Federal Statistics, and the Deming Lecture Award. Um, he is also um, the, an associate editor in the, for the Journal of Official Statistics and for Survey Methodology Journal and co-editor of the Harvard Data Science Review. His uh, research areas include data quality, design optimization, integration of multiple data <coughs> sources, imputation, time series, and small domain estimation. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Leica. I'm going to talk today about um, transparency reproducibility uh, issues related to um, wide range of activities in the integration of multiple data sources. For the most part, I'll be considering this within the context of work um, for uh, government statistical agencies, but as we'll see, we hope we have a lot of applications on the areas. Especially delighted to have a chance to visit with all of you today. Uh, I had a chance to meet with several folks uh, ahead of time, uh, but also to give this presentation here. As you'll see, I don't have any answers. Uh, what I have is a certain set of questions, and I very much uh, hope to uh, uh, see if we have ideas from anybody here in the audience. So, uh, if you have any questions during the uh, presentation or afterwards, I'm uh, absolutely delighted to uh, have a chance to uh, hear those. Again, I probably won't have any answers, but we can at least think a little bit about the questions. Um, to cover the quest general question about transparency, reproducibility, and replicability, uh, we're going to start with a little bit of discussion about broad concepts related to uh, transparency, reproducibility, and replicability. Um, which we'll abbreviate fairly quickly with the uh, initials TRR. Um, and then we're going to take the second major component, major element of what we'll be considering today, which is the integration of multiple data sources, which I believe provides us with a really nice opportunity to think in quite a bit of depth about the general notions of transparency, reproducibility, replicability, but now in a somewhat different, perhaps somewhat broader context that we're accustomed to thinking about for traditional sample surveys that in turn will require us to go back and think in a little bit of depth about the concept of design, in particular broaden or expand the notion of design from what we may have been accustomed to thinking about uh, before, either in experimental sense or in the sense of either observational or sample survey type uh, designs. That in turn will lead to a number of questions related to approximations, and in particular I would be suggesting, uh, still more of a question than answer, uh, but suggesting that if we want to talk about transparency, reproducibility, and replicability, we need to embed that discussion in the general notion of approximations and adequacy of a given set of approximations that we may have at a given time. And then we'll finish with a set of questions, again, related to transparency, reproducibility, and replicability. Um, first of all, uh, let's have a quick show of hands here. How many of you are in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics? Okay. Anybody here from either the social sciences or other application type areas? Okay. Okay. Um, those of you both in the math and stat department, but also those of you who have been involved with social science or biomedical science type applications, especially over about the last decade, uh, we've had quite a um, both flourishing and in some ways a resurgence of interest in the general notions of transparency, reproducibility, and replicability. The general argument behind this enhancement um, has been that we want to, in fact, improve the underlying scientific processes that we have, um, and also, in turn, with that, enhance 
uh, level of public confidence that we have in the results that we see. They might be in terms of statistical information produced by a government statistical agency. It might be confidence in the types of statistical information that we have produced, for example, in a medical school or other type of application area, as well as social sciences and a lot of other cases like that. And if we dig a little deeper into the idea of enhancement of both the scientific process and public confidence, this usually involves two major areas of activity. One is to look internally and to say, I want to do something, and by having improved transparency, can that help me to improve internal operational processes that we have and the related decisions that we're carrying out? And again, this could be government statistical agencies, clinical trials, lots of other areas like that. In some sense saying, I want to improve the information, I want to improve the way in which I, quote, move certain levers, unquote, in response to that improved information that I have. And the second, we need to think about communicating these ideas to a wide range of external stakeholders, in some ways the, quote, data users, unquote, that we have. Or again, that may be a very wide range of people, both from the general press, for example, that may be reporting on statistical information from a statistical agency or from a clinical trial as reported in a scientific journal. It may be the editors or reviewers of certain scientific journals. It may be people who are going to be making secondary use of our data. All of those we'll be referring to as our secondary stakeholders or external stakeholders. In general, we need to talk about some distinctions, essentially a comparison and contrast between the related notions of transparency, reproducibility, and replicability. I will start with the notion of transparency. Basic idea is, quote, putting all of our cards on the table, unquote. Uh, or to say that in a little bit more refined way, we want to have some kind of clear communication at appropriate levels of detail. And as I've indicated here, that's in some ways the really crucial question. What do we mean by appropriate levels of detail that are really going to resonate with our audiences and our data users? And do that in a way that helps people to understand somewhat more about our goals. Okay, what are we really trying to accomplish with a certain kind of study? Essentially, the fundamentals that you have, perhaps, in the first or second lecture that you have in the introductory statistics course, but nonetheless crucial even for very sophisticated users. What's the population that I'm trying to talk about in a given case? What types of inferential questions are we trying to ask about underlying parameters of those populations? What's the intended use that we have for the resulting information? And if we understand something about the intended use, does that tell us something about the level of precision and more broadly the level of quality that we need to have for that information for it truly to be useful uh, for <clears throat> our data users? Uh, once we know something about the uh, goals that we have for a study, what can we say about the design? And we'll say in a few minutes something in more greater depth about a very broad definition of design, essentially referring to allocation of any of our resources for the entire scope of activity from, first of all, simply formulating a set of questions, collecting data, and carrying out inferences, as well as disseminating that information to our stakeholders. Um, third point is to say, well, you have the design and then you have to put it into practice. What's their operational characteristics that you have? What did you really do? Was it truly aligned with the design, or do you have certain types of deviations or imperfections in the way that you are going to be implementing this work? Um, I have yet to see over a frightening number of years, it's at least 35, depending on you count, um, applied statistics operation, I have yet to see a case where an operation truly had a perfect match with the state of design. There's always something that happens in the field. It's very much worthwhile to think about what that something is and the impact it may have on the quality of our inference. And then finally, once we have all that information, uh, we need to be able to say something in a transparent way, again, truly useful for and will really resonate with our users about what the outcomes were that we have, the formal types of inferential statements we may be able to make or not make based on that, and then any types of nuances or cautionary notes that we need to be sure to have in reporting those types of results. So that's the notion of transparency, and that's something that receives a great deal of attention. And there have been several National Academy panels in different sub-disciplines in the last few years exploring them. To some degree, those National Academy panels have also explored the notions of reproducibility and replicability. And in particular, the basic idea of reproducibility takes the notion of transparency and stretches it just a little bit further. It says, well, what can we share with all of our stakeholders about the procedures that we use to collect our data? Second, what do we know about the data? Can we actually share the data with them? And you have to watch the word data. It's often not necessarily just the raw data that we've captured, 
but then all of the work we may have carried out in terms of editing, imputation, any number of other steps that we had to carry out before we could really carry out a formal statistical analysis <coughs> and the resulting inference. In parallel with that, what do we have available that we can share with others regarding the code and regarding the, kind of, uh, the documentation uh, related to either the data capture process itself or any kind of editor reputation or subsequent analysis that we have? What can we say? What can we share with our users? And as many of you are aware, both Journal of American Statistical Association and several other um, leading journals from quite a number of area, um, quite a number of disciplines have moved toward having a combination of expectations of deposit of a combination of the data that were used for a given article and also deposit of the code that was used for a given article. Victoria Stodden, as some of you are aware, is the first data editor for Journal of American Statistical Association. Larsville Huber is the first uh, data editor for the American Economic <coughs> Association, a couple of their uh, leading journals that we have. This is something that's been getting a lot of attention. It's essentially taking this admirable general principle of reproducibility and saying, what do we really have to do to have this truly implemented in practice? And the idea, to some degree realized, and to some degree still just a notion, is that we would like to be able to have somebody who's an outsider be able to truly reproduce, in quotes, an entire analysis, all of the components related to that. Partly this is a way of ensuring that um, we essentially have a very high degree of reliability of the reported results. Somebody hasn't made a mistake or otherwise I have some kind of problems with the, the analysis that you're reporting. But there's also a closely related idea, which is, let's have a quick show of hands here. How many of you have ever read a journal article and said, golly, that's really interesting. I'd like to either look at this data myself or I would like to build on the code that somebody may have had for a certain purpose. Many of you have had that experience before. A lot of folks. This is a way of trying to go from, again, that admirable notion to truly having that available. So that's the idea of reproducibility we have. Third notion, uh, and to say a little bit more about this idea of, of reproducibility, you will often hear it stated in the fairly absolutist form of saying, can we in fact have an independent analyst produce exactly the same results using the very same original data set and analysis methods? Uh, to some, in some cases, in Victoria Stodden's book that I referenced a moment ago is a really nice example of this, that's viewed largely in a computational form. Do we have the code? Do we have the same data set? In other cases, especially involving highly exploratory analyses, even though this is the admirable goal that we may have, because there are inherent judgment calls involved with a number of those activities, we really have to be a little cautious about overpromising in some cases about the full scale of reproducibility. Again, especially if you have highly exploratory analyses that you consider. <coughs> the third notion. Um, in this uh, trio of transparency, reproducibility, and replicability, uh, suggests the following. Again, it's trying to see the extent to which we can push that even a little further. And the suggestion is, could we in fact carry out de novo, from scratch, complete replication of our full process from going from fresh data collection, presumably from the same population, and analysis of the results, and inference. And in some ways, that's viewed as an acid test of cases. And many of you have seen cases where, in fact, there have been real challenges in literature, perhaps especially in the biomedical and social science literature, about the number of cases in which we cannot, quote, replicate the study, unquote, which in turn leads to real concerns about studies that are not replicable, but nonetheless have led to major recommendations, for example, about this or that uh, pharmaceutical or other medical treatment should or should not be used for a particular population in a given case as well as a lot of other cases. That's a very desirable outcome that we would like to have. If you think about implementing that, in some cases you could say, well, I have a clinical trial, I will have a comparable population, I would really like to be able to carry that type of work out. Because we think, or we hope, that we can in fact replicate truly most or all of the important elements of what was carried out in that study. In some cases, we'll see in a few minutes, when we're thinking about cases involving government statistical agencies, and in particular the efforts of government statistical agencies to start to make use of data that are sometimes referred to as organic or non-design data, for example, for administrative or commercial records, you can end up saying, well, I really only have, in some sense, one set of those administrative records. If, for example, they're on a tax or benefit administration program, 
there is really no hypothetical way in which we can say, well, can I really replicate that entire process? So it's very much worthwhile to think about this replicability, but you'll notice that in my original title, I stopped at reproducibility, I'm focusing most of the attention today just on transparency, just on the reproducibility notion. That in itself, you'll see, has a lot of questions related to that. There's a lot of stuff, uh, literature that's been uh, developed along these lines in the last few years. I cited a few National Academy reports here uh, that are very much worthwhile looking at. In addition, there's an additional National Academy consensus panel by way of the Committee on National Statistics uh, that is currently having a series of meetings. We'll have a further report uh, that comes out focused largely on um, federal statistical uh, system results. This is also closely related to what many of you have been reading about is referred to as the reproducibility crisis. A number of comments that the <clears throat> American Statistical Association and other groups uh, have been focusing on in terms of p-values. Those are very much worth considering as well. As we'll see today, that's very much worth considering in the context of government statistics as well. But it's also very much worthwhile to think about in large notion, large range of notions going beyond so-called p-value controversies and p-hacking to think about underlying bias and variance characteristics, for example, that we have in their underlying data sources. At least to the second topic. Um, historically, most government statistical agencies, both in the United States and throughout much of the rest of the world, have focused on most of their work in the form of sample surveys. That's been the primary vehicle by which they have sought to collect data, which they then analyzed, and then end up producing results, for example, estimated unemployment rate, estimated inflation rates, lots of other types of analyses related to that. Over the last couple of decades, um, there's been a lot of interest in moving beyond that into what are referred to variously as non-designed or organic or big data, sometimes referred to as digital exhaust. Um, I've given some references here. Basic idea is, gee, the government has, and has had for many years, a large number of administrative records uh, typically involved in taxes uh, or <coughs> taxes uh, administration of various types of benefit programs, uh, as well as other types of information that's readily available. Under those circumstances, to what extent can government statistical agencies make use of those data while at the same time being very rigorous in the way in which we protect the privacy and confidentiality of the individuals or groups that end up providing those data? That's something that there's a lot of interest in uh, over the course of time. I've cited a few references here. And as a result of that, we need to go back and reconsider a wide range of different questions about what do we mean by quality of our data, which ties in very directly with these notions of transparency and reproducibility. At the same time, we're carrying that out in a societal environment that is in itself very much dynamic. And in particular, we're seeing a lot of changing expectations regarding the notions of privacy on the one hand, as well as the notions and expectations that we have for many of our stakeholders in terms of the granularity, essentially wanting finer and finer grained information, either is defined by temporal granularity, essentially we want something faster with a finer time scale, or finer geographical scale or finer other forms of cross-sectional uh, scales. For example, industrial classification, occupational classification, demographic characteristics, other things like that. And in addition, um, there was a, a bipartisan commission on evidence-based policymaking that pulled together a lot of these threads in terms of recommendations. They came out with a, a final report just about exactly two years ago. Some of that has been embedded already in legislation and is in many ways going to be informing an awful lot of the debate we're seeing in these areas over the next many years. <clears throat> All of that together has led to a set of questions about to what extent and in what ways can we take these so-called non-survey data sources and what ways can we integrate them in a truly rigorous, scientifically and statistically rigorous form to be able to carry out really strong inferences about certain underlying population characteristics? It's the fundamental question that we're going to be thinking about when we talk about integration of multiple data sources. And I'll give you three examples to try to fix these ideas in a little bit of depth. The first one we'll call example A. This is a mnemonic for appending microdata. Basic idea is we have a traditional sample survey. But then we say, gee, one or more of the items that we're trying to capture through that sample survey is problematic. It may be problematic either because it's very burdensome, I'll give you an example of that in a second, or 
because it is something that somebody simply cannot record very well. And illustration of both of those together um, involved my wife and myself. We were respondents a number of years ago for the American Community Survey. This was a time when both of our kids uh, were still legally under our umbrella, uh, but they were college students and therefore relatively independent. We received this American Community Survey instrument about six months after we had filed the last round of tax papers. We had helped our kids some in terms of filing their papers, a uh, usual 1040 uh, forms. But for the life of me, I couldn't remember the numbers on it. But nonetheless, legally, the kids were still classified as being under our umbrella. We were supposed to report for them. And when you get to the American Community Survey, you'll see some basic demographic characteristics. Okay, tell us about the gender, uh, age, and so on like that. We could answer those without any trouble with our kids. Um, we still remember when they were born, even though it was a number of years ago. But on the other hand, when we got to the income section, my wife and I could fill that out with a reasonable degree of accuracy for ourselves. But when we got to the kids, it was, oh, hmm. What do we remember? That was six months ago. Um, and so in fact, we I will confess, we wrote down at best a very rough guess. And furthermore, it was unquestionably the most burdensome component of that. Uh, obvious question under those circumstances is, under certain circumstances, in particular with informed consent of a prospective respondent, would it be better to let somebody check a box and say, instead of burdening me with this question, I am giving you informed consent to go import those data from, in this case it would be by IRS 1040 records, for example. Uh, you've got a lot of other cases that would be uh, akin to that. One that's received a lot of attention the last few years involves consumer expenditures. Um, consumer expenditure survey has been around in various forms for a number of decades and a continuous operation since 1980. Field work is carried out by the Census Bureau on behalf of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's a fundamental part of the Consumer Price Index calculation process. Consumer Expenditure Survey is an extraordinarily burdensome survey. I have done field observation for it, and I have absolute admiration for both the respondents, but also for the data collection personnel who we ask to carry out this data collection. A typical time elapsed for one of five interviews that is carried out is two hours. And we are asking at that point for people to re recall their expenditures at a relatively fine level of specificity over the course of the previous three months. And sometimes with very big ticket items, for example, I bought a car. Okay, that's something you're probably going to be able to remember. And if you don't remember it, you probably still have a sales receipt or other type of information you can refer to pretty quickly. If, on the other hand, I were to ask Michael, Michael, can you tell me what did you spend on dairy products? Not just last week when you we went to the grocery store, but Tell me about September, okay? Uh, you, you can start to do some back of the mind calculations, and my wife and I would say, oh, let's see, it's about a gallon and a half of milk a week, and I think it's about this much. But you run out of steam pretty quickly. An obvious question is, my goodness, giant grocery store, Safeway, pretty much any of the other major grocery stores have all that information. If you have a loyalty card with one or more of those organizations, they, in fact, can tell you not just, yeah, you bought skim milk. They can tell you exactly the date and time in which you bought it. They can say what you bought it with in far more detail than I, as a human being, could ever possibly hope to remember, especially if you're asking me to carry out recall three months from now. Can we, again, with appropriate informed consent by a respondent, can we get that type of information? That would be an example where we try to append one or more variables to a sample survey that we would be continuing to conduct on an ongoing basis. Another example, called example B, and uh, that's a mnemonic for backbone and bridge. Basic idea is that in many cases, arguably all cases, involving some kind of administrative or commercial data set, you will often have, perhaps always, population coverage that is pretty good, you hope, but is by no means 100%. You're going to miss some. Go back to my example that I just had. I named Giant, I named Safeway, you can name Trader Joe's, a few other places. And then you stop and say, oh, wait a minute, what about that farmer's market that I went to on Saturday morning? I paid cash for a couple of loaves of bread and some apple cider. Okay, that's never gonna show up in a loyalty card and you're only gonna be able to capture that information if you're lucky, either by talking about the people who are doing the retail sales at the farmer's market 
or by hoping that I'll remember that. Somehow you have a backbone of one or more data sets that you think are pretty reliable but are not going to have perfect population coverage. How do you bridge the gap? Similarly, in many cases, you also have to bridge a gap because information that's collected through certain types of administrative records are not comprehensive. They're missing something. They either have too much or too little of what you want. A good example goes back to loyalty <coughs> cards that we have um, for grocery store. My wife teaches English as a second language some evenings. And sometimes one or both of us will go to the grocery store and we will pick something up, not for our personal consumption, but instead to take to where we're going to have this ESL class because the kids want cookies or chips or things like that. Okay, that's not a consumer purchase at that point. Because it's in, it's in this case food being provided by way of an institution, it's not a consumer expenditure survey. In a formal sense, we don't want those data captured. We hope to exclude them in some fashion from the consumer expenditure survey. Okay, it's really hard to disentangle that. Is there a way that you can do that? Somehow you've got to think about both a subset over coverage and under coverage in each of those cases. So you have to have some kind of bridge. You're going to have to have some kind of sample survey that captures those subtleties, essentially as a way of patching up or dealing with limitations that you have inherent in these administrative records, of course, safe courses. For that reason, you will frequently hear people say sample surveys are, uh, quote, fading over time, unquote. I disagree with that respectfully. I, in fact, will argue that we may be very well entering into a golden era of sample surveys in the sense we have to go back and think about the fundamental concepts, essentially what drove original sample survey design a number of decades ago. We have to go back and rethink those in very deep ways to try to capture the kinds of concepts and issues that we're referring to here. Wonderful opportunity to do so. In addition, it's arguable that uh, small domain estimation also fits in this backbone and bridge area and has for, um, depending on you count it, at least 35 years. Um, third example involves cleaning of data. Very frequently when you were looking at administrative or commercial records, sources, based on that understanding, then I want to somehow have some methods to integrate those data together. How do you do that? Basic ideas go back, and as I said a second ago, you need to reconsider some of the fundamental design concepts that in certain ways have been around for about a century, if not longer. And in particular, go back and review the fundamental concepts we have of saying, well, what am I trying to accomplish? Uh, and for the discussion here, we'll say I have a certain set of parameters, theta, vector, that I'm trying to estimate. <clears throat> in traditional government statistics forms, often these are relatively conceptually relatively simple quantities. For example, population mean, population quantiles, major regression coefficients, uh, other parameters related to generalized linear models or hierarchical models. In some cases, if you listen to a particular stakeholder and say, what are you really trying to accomplish? What do you really want to get in this particular case? And if you don't let them too quickly say, oh, just give me X bar, or give me beta, but actually listen to how are you really going to use these data, sometimes what they really want is something that amounts to a posterior predictive distribution for a particular set of variables conditional upon certain other variables. For example, posterior predictive distribution of income conditional upon certain demographic, educational, other characteristics of uh, a given individual or a given household. That's the sort of thing we're going to have here. And we'll just take that in a very uh, broad brush way of saying we're going to have a certain parameter, vector parameters, theta. We then say that we have multiple sources providing a <clears throat> very large vector of data y. So this could be a combination of sample surveys and administrative <coughs> records and commercial records that I was referencing a few minutes ago. And then we have some kind of underlying model <clears throat> by which we try to understand something about this distribution of y conditional upon certain other variables, x and z, that I'll get to in a few minutes, as well as an underlying parameter beta. So beta would be, for example, a regression coefficient for a model. We ultimately want to estimate something like a mean or median of the underlying population. That's our theta. And we're going to do that by way of both the directly observed data that we have, y, but also this auxiliary information, x and z, that we'll be referencing in a few minutes. <coughs> but these underlying models are crucial because they will, for example, tell us about, for example, Underlying model for true outcome, often referred to as a superpopulation model. It may be pretty quickly what you end up finding, it's been well recognized for decades, um, is that historically we as statisticians have tended to focus most of our attention when we use the word quality on essentially accuracy. In some sense, tell me about the mean squared error that I have. 
typically aligned in sample survey setting, the so-called total survey or model, so let's discuss in a few minutes. Uh, or in close relation to that, tell me something about the properties I may have for an interval estimate. Tell me something about the honest to goodness coverage rate under certain circumstances. Tell me something about the distribution of widths of the, of the confidence, in it, for example, or a credible interval or some other kind of interval estimate. However, when you talk to our stakeholders, the people who are really using the results of these data analyses, typically the narrative we receive is, yes, accuracy is terribly important, and, and then they start naming a number of other dimensions that they also say are terribly important. Uh, they would use language like relevance, timeliness, comparability, um, coherence, accessibility, granularity, interpretability, a lot of other terms. That's been studied and explored in a lot of depth. Uh, Gordon Braxton has a wonderful paper from about 20 years ago uh, in uh, uh, Survey and Methodology Journal. Uh, Committee on National Statistics had a really nice, um, <clears throat> a really nice uh, volume uh, from a consensus panel report uh, related to integration of multiple sources from a couple of years ago that go into further depth on that. Europeans have also done a lot of work in that area, particularly Eurostat folks. <clears throat> so there are many different dimensions of quality we have to think about. So we can no longer just boil this down to mean square. We need to think about all of these components of uncertainty or variability or quality that we have attached to this. And one of the many questions that I'd like to, to talk about today, highlight, is that we have a pretty good idea about how to characterize in a rigorous mathematical way the notions of accuracy that I was referencing before. We seem to have much less of a rigorous basis if we're saying can we put some kind of quantitative structure on these other notions of quantity, like uh, of quality, like relevance, uh, timeliness, and comparability. How would we go about doing that? Uh, my suggestion is that in some cases the best way to think about it is to say let's talk about a predictive distribution, and that may be a way to try to anchor those other discussions. We'll talk about that further if you'd like. In addition, any type of large-scale statistical organization, in addition to thinking about quality also spends a lot of time thinking about risk and cost. And the expectations that we would typically see, as characterized by the, the expectations we see for either transparency or for replicability or reproducibility, all of those fundamentally involve us thinking both about the quality characteristics that we have here and also require us to think about the risk and cost characteristics and ways in which we can try to have some kind of rigorous description of each of those. And if we're going to, my, one of my many suggestions here is going to be that if we want to talk in a really rigorous way about what do you mean by transparency, what do you mean by reproducibility or replicability, an awful lot of it amounts to saying what are the dominant components of variability and certainty we have attached to all these notions of quality and risk and cost, and how much can we help our users understand each of those characteristics. That's one of the suggestions we'll have. To explore that in a little bit greater depth, <clears throat> take that very vague, fuzzy notion and turn it into something a little bit more structured. Basic idea would be, go back to those terms Z and X that I referenced a moment ago and I promised to get back to. Um, we're going to say that we, in trying to carry out some kind of procedure that will have some appropriate balance of quality, risk, and cost, suggestion is going to be that we need to think about a very broad, broadly defined operating space in which we're trying to carry out that type of optimization, in some sense, exercise. And in particular, we'll say we have an op uh, operating space that's defined by a vector z. This is going to be a, a characteristics that we can call environmental in nature, in that we hope we can observe them, but we effectively have no control over them. Uh, one example I'll get to in a little bit more depth in a few minutes involves public expectations regarding questions of privacy and burden that I was touching on briefly before. That's something that we need to be very responsive to. It's critical as part of our mission as a statistical agency. Um, but it's something that we really have very little in the way of very direct control over. But it's a matter of trying to understand what the expectations of the public are at a given time and try to be as responsive as we can to them. Second, we have a set of characteristics that, in fact, we believe we do control. We'll refer to it as a design vector, which is essentially a set of resource allocation decisions that have been made by a statistical agency or our partners to the extent that they're contributing to discussion as well. Regarding a wide range of decisions that have to be made before we end up carrying out a practical exercise in collecting and then disseminating data. We have to make a decision, for example, about what sources of data, honest to goodness, are we really going to use? Not just think about, but which ones are we really going to use in production at a given time? 
So we can call that set of decisions, we can represent it with a subvector, we'll call it x source. What are the methods by which we're going to be carrying out all the, carry, all the activities that I described a few minutes ago? For example, evaluating quality characteristics. How are we going to integrate those data uh, in a certain way? How are we going to go about carrying out point estimation, some kind of interval estimation, or other types of inference? The whole body of methodology that we have with that. Once we wrote that algebra down on a piece of paper, and then we say, OK, I have to actually do it. I have some kind of production system. And often you will see, especially in discussion of reproducibility issues, the question of the gap that may exist between the idealist methodology that we have in a given case and the honest to goodness system capabilities we have for producing that either because of scalability issues or any number of other reasons, becomes crucial as well. A lot of administrative questions come in here. <clears throat> For example, um, in traditional sample survey areas, there were often very heated debates and continue to be very heated debates about the question of how often do we end up carrying out training for a particular set of field observation personnel, data collection personnel. It's recognized it's crucial, but what exactly do you do? How do you do it? Many other questions like that are crucial. That's what we put under this vector that we'll call X admin. And then finally, because we're talking about transparent communication, let's go ahead and think about uh, design decisions about exactly how and what we're communicating uh, to all of our stakeholders. All of that together we'll call our design vector. So that's a very high dimensional vector. Environmental characteristics that we're trying to deal with are very high dimensional vector as well. <clears throat> with all of that, we can then pull it together and say, all right, then let's think about a schematic model. I'll emphasize the word schematic here. Um, I will be ecstatic if at any point between now and when I retire in 11 years, um, if I ever actually get to a point where I can truly write down this model and truly estimate the, all the underlying parameters in there. Nonetheless, it's very much worthwhile to think about this schematic model. Um, and in particular, we can say, take all of the vector, the large vector that we have of quality and risk and cost characteristics we referred to a few minutes ago. Think about that as essentially left-hand side of the equation. Now, I'm going to be trying to fit some kind of model, we'll call it G, um, with reference to the underlying parameters theta that we're trying to estimate. We're going to try to think about that vector of quality, risk, and cost characteristics as being somehow a function of our underlying environmental characteristics, Z, that we have. Again, we get to observe it, I hope, but don't get to control it. Second, the characteristics X that we are able to control. And then a certain set of parameters, gamma, and some kind of disturbance or perturbation term we'll call, absolute, uh, we'll call E here. E is all the residual effects where we, we uh, neither get to control nor even get to observe. We'll say that gamma is the parameters that we have for this underlying performance profile, such as the mean structure that we have, as well as dispersion effects. And so at this point, we need to stop and say we've effectively got three sets of parameters that we're thinking about here. We have the ones we really care about from a substantive point of view. These are my thetas, things like the population mean or median. So this might be, for example, median income that we have for people in a certain demographic group. Second, we have the vector beta. These are the underlying characteristics, for example, underlying superpopulation model, or a model for the propensity of a given person to respond to an income question. Now third, we've got this extra vector, uh, vector of parameters gamma, which are essentially saying, let's understand something about the underlying characteristics of this performance profile. So for example, <clears throat> in traditional sample survey areas, Especially in the 1960s, 70s, and somewhat into the 1980s, there was very intense study of what were referred to as variance function models, in which we were trying to understand, we as a community were trying to understand the underlying sampling error variances that we had for a given set of estimators represented this function of certain underlying population characteristics. In that case, the parameters that we have for that underlying variance function model would have been some of these gamma. Similarly, episodically, there's been a lot of interest in cost structures. And again, for the case of cost structures, we have various types of cost models that have been proposed over the course of time. Those parameters would be other examples of the gammas. We need to think about those three different vectors of parameters as rather distinct, although interrelated, uh, to each other. And in looking at all of those, it's really important to spell the dominant layers of condition. Again, that's a fundamental requirement that we have. We're going to have a transparent set of reports in these areas. So, if you think about this in a somewhat idealized way, you might have something like the graph that we have here. 
Um, we've been ex um, being extremely simple about the way in which we represent this, but along the <coughs> uh, uh, axis coming out of the plane here, X's, that's our design characteristics, what we think we're able to control. I'll reduce that to a single dimension, even though it's a multi-dimensional vector. Along the horizontal axis, we have the vector Z, again, reduced to a single dimension for illustrative purposes here. These are the environmental characteristics we have. And then the outcome, uh, excuse me, the performance profile that we have, the P, is going to be our vertical axis here. I presented this in what could be the most simple-minded, idealized way we possibly could. If we lived in a perfect world, we would have a really nice quadratic looking function. And at that point, if you say your charge would be dual, if you're trying to talk about transparency, reproducibility, and replicability. First of all, for purposes of transparency, can I show this entire profile here? Can I show this surface? If so, that could help my stakeholders understand a whole lot, both about in your current operating setting, where are you? Well, I'm at a certain point x. Well, if in fact you were to change that, what, what would that do? Would that, call it, would, would that maybe produce some improvement or not? And similarly, gee, societal conditions are changing. So if in fact we were changing the value of Z, for example, again, societal expectations related to um, uh, privacy and confidentiality, if we could somehow really characterize that in single dimensions we have here, we could understand something about are we at some relatively stable point in the surface or are we at an extremely unstable point in which moderate changes in societal expectations could perhaps lead to major changes, maybe degradation, in terms of the performance that we have? That's the idealized sign that we live in. There's another related question, which is that it is rare, if not impossible, for a statistical community, uh, in particular large-scale statistical organizations, to live in an unconstrained world. Uh, it is be a really nice thing if I could just pick any point on that surface that I want to live on. But first of all, I don't get to pick my Z. I get that handed to me by society at a given time. Second, I almost never really get to pick my X in an entirely unconstrained way. Instead, I end up having any number of external forces say, John, it's really admirable if you would like to slide. All set. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if I'm record this time. Okay. And somebody says, John, it's really admirable that you'd like to live in that world, but I'm sorry. You see the zone over here, the shaded green? That's the best we can do for you. Okay, at that point then, the question becomes, okay, how far can I crowd that limit? Can I live as close to the uh, minimum? For example, minimum mean squared error, as I, I, I hope for. Um, there's a further problem that often comes up, brief about this. Um, what exactly, if we want to talk about transparency, what can we communicate um, to our stakeholders about what are the predominant estimate, uh, what are the predominant estimates of thetas that we, we really are focused on. So if we start making statements saying this method has been thoroughly vetted and in fact it is a very good method, we need to finish that sentence by saying for estimation of the following key parameters. We can't necessarily make a sweeping statement across the board. What kind of conditioning do we have related to that? And in particular, <clears throat> uh, what kind of conditioning do we have on the underlying societal characteristics that I was describing, as well as a number of assumptions that we almost always have to make regarding underlying model characteristics as well. <clears throat> uh, next question about uh, transparency is what can we report in a transparent way about our nominal design vector, what we hope to be carrying out in the field? What are the intended, cons uh, what are the intended settings? What do we know about the constraints, like the green zone I was referencing a moment ago, are they stable? as we represent in the graph, or in fact, do we have a certain degree of instability or uncertainty attached uh, to those constraints? Another question that very frequently shows up, um, both <clears throat> in traditional sample survey settings, but also in terms of work with integration of non-survey sources, like administrative or commercial sources, is we have a certain nominal design, and then we have a certain degree of slippage that takes place, sometimes characterized as operational error. Uh, traditional sample surveys, this often shows up when we have field work that really was not carried out as specified. There's always a certain amount of imperfection in a field work. As I said, I've been involved with this field for 35 years and I have yet to see uh, a survey operation uh, carried out in an absolutely pristine way exactly as specified. Always going to have variability and always going to have problems. Uh, similarly, when we're talking about administrative sources, often we will have characteristics that are based on some kind of negotiation with the organizations providing those data and then there's often going to be slippage uh, related to that. 
For example, it's broadly acknowledged that administrative or commercial activities have these types of data produced not as their primary purpose, but as, quote, exhaust, unquote, is a term that's often used. It's essentially a byproduct. And so if there are compelling managerial, legal, other reasons to change the underlying processes in that administrative or commercial activity, that is likely to result in changes in the underlying data. But we have to be effectively reactive in a timely way for that. Um, anybody here from engineering or otherwise involved with engineering? Okay. Um, there's a wonderful literature in the engineering um, uh, research uh, area that's under the broad rubric of, quote, fault-tolerant design. Um, basic idea, I'm going to ask people to show their age here. How many of you, when you, your very first time you ever did some kind of word processing, the very first time you actually got to print out something uh, that you had typed yourself? Okay, for me that experience was almost exactly 30 years ago. Um, what happened, probably either the first or second or third time you did it, uh, you thought you had the file and then something went wrong and you basically had to start entirely from scratch because you lost your file. How many people have that experience? Oh, yeah. Okay. And on the other hand, uh, those who are under the age of something probably don't even remember that because we have an extremely fault-tolerant software now that, in fact, almost automatically recovers, almost auto, always, always automatically recovers. That's a very simple idea, fault-tolerant design. We need to borrow a lot from our engineering colleagues in this area and try to understand how can we characterize and develop fault-tolerant designs in these <coughs> types of areas we have for integration sources. Um, second, going back to the environmental factor C, what do we know and what do we not know uh, about that? What kind of variability do we have? And we can either think about variability in terms of some kind of probability distribution or otherwise across subpopulations, across time, or across other characteristics that we think are, are uh, important. Um, to what extent can we actually observe? I cheerfully said, well, Z are variables that we observe. Sometimes the question of observability of important environmental factors is in itself a somewhat uncertain question about the extent, degree, and timeliness of the ways in which you can take, um, truly take um, actionable observations on that. And to what extent, if you aren't able to make perfect observations, can you have some kind of indications of leading indicators for that? A good example of this goes back to the attitudes regarding privacy and confidentiality that I was referring to before. Here are three related questions. Um, often, as I was highlighting a few minutes ago, we can't just cheerfully carry out some kind of linkage on our own because we want to, but in some fashion, either implicitly or explicitly, and varies across different countries and different legal settings, we have to get some kind of consent to link. I can't simply say, gee, giant grocery store, send me all of the loyalty card data from the following people. Okay, that's going to be a total non-starter. But instead, could we maybe get a respondent to say, Okay, I have a choice. I can spend the next hour trying to do this recall of how much skin milk I bought, or maybe I can provide informed consent and say, gee, I bought all that stuff at giant grocery store or Safeway, and I will provide informed consent for that. Um, what's, the <coughs> what's the propensity that somebody has um, to, in fact, provide that type of consent? To Nine, a couple of co authors had a paper in Journal of Survey Statistics and Methodology a couple of years ago on that. That's closely related to broad observations that have been made uh, very widely about changes in public trust, both in the United States and a lot of other countries. And on the other hand, perceptions related to response burden, essentially tension between those two. Another example that comes up, uh, there's a National Crime Victimization Survey. It's been ongoing for a number of decades now. Uh, carried out uh, field work by, carried out by the Census Bureau on behalf of the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And that is an effort to get at fairly finely detailed information about crime victimization, both in terms of violent crime and in terms of uh, property crimes, across a wide range of um, uh, experiences, wide range of different characteristics. When one looks at the comparison of those results and trends over time in those results relative to uh, essentially police reports, or referred to as uniform crime report, those two do not necessarily match up perfectly. You have a sample survey, you have administrative records, which is essentially the National Crime um, um, Uniform Crime Report. Neither one is perfect. There are limitations to each of those. And one of the fundamental questions is closely related to this idea of privacy and confidentiality is the extent to which a given respondent may or may not be willing to report crime, either on a sample survey, 
uh, instrument or report crime uh, to local police. That can vary over time. This has received a lot of attention in the United States as well as in Europe. In Europe, both with regard to data collection for official statistics purposes and for a lot of commercial purposes, some of you may have heard of the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, um, that came out about three years ago and is receiving a great deal of attention both in, United, both in um, um, the European Union and elsewhere uh, in the world. Essentially reflecting changing societal views on this, which in turn can affect the way in which we carry out this work. So how can we be transparent about the way in which we're responding to that and the impact that it's going to have on the underlying surfaces that we have? What do we know about the underlying performance profile vectors? I said in a certain way, if we could display that performance profile vector surface in a uniform uh, way, a perfect level of, of granularity, that would be a really transparent set of results. But as I just said in the last couple of minutes, we have fundamental limitations on just how well we really can understand what that performance profile looks like. What can we say about the estimability and stability of these vectors, um, this parameter vector gamma? What do you know about the quality of the model fit and the amount of residual <coughs> variance that we have? We may have, for example, something that based on the surface I displayed a few minutes ago looks like a really nice model fit. And if I cheerfully say I'm so proud I worked really hard and I have an R square of 1%, what are you going to say? Thank you, John, for doing that work. But in terms of the real efficacy, uh, it's really not going to get me much in the way of uh, performance. So I need to understand something about the residual variance, just what's my predictive performance today. What do I know about interactions? What do I know about essentially local slopes and local curvature characteristics, especially in cases where the only real debate I'm having involves modest changes that might be taking place in some of the, um, the, uh, some of the uh, design characteristics? We'll finish with a few cautionary uh, notes about this. And in particular, often when you hear people talk about transparency, reproducibility, and replicability, if you let them talk long enough, they will start to think in causal terms, and they will in start to think, gee, you know, if we were to move this lever, if we were to change this design characteristic in a certain way, gee, I think a certain data source, and if we're going to use it, how exactly are we going to use it? Um, and second, uh, for extra external purposes, how exactly is someone to end up using these data products, and if so, how? Um, Previous literature in this area is focused almost exclusively on accuracy components and usually by way of so-called total survey error models. Um, an example of a total survey error model is what we have displayed at the bottom of the page here, where we say I have a certain estimator, we'll call it theta hat. We say, tell me about the difference between the theta hat and the underlying true estimate on theta. Again, this might be, for example, median income for people in a certain demographic group. We can think about that as being decomposed into the sum of several different error terms, for example, so-called coverage error that can show up either in terms of sample surveys or with administrative and commercial records. Further effect, traditionally called sampling error, more broadly called selection effects showing up. Issues related to incomplete error, uh, excuse me, incomplete data measurement error, as well as any kind of analysis effects and also prospectively so-called added noise involved with disclosure and protection uh, exercises. Uh, we have a series of uh, workshops uh, covering some of these topics in the Federal Committee on Statistical Methodology and Washington Statistical Society over the last uh, two and a half years. A uh, wide range of topics that we touched on at the bottom of the uh, slide uh, here. We're talking about input data sources, processing output data sources, um, as well as specialized topics. And we're hoping to have one more of these probably in the late winter or early spring uh, involving ways in which we try to align quality measures with underlying stakeholder value. In the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip the remaining detailed questions. And <coughs> happy to talk about this more during the discussion period, if you'd like. And say, in summary, then, we believe that transparency and reproducibility is a really interesting topic, and it's really important as statistical agencies and other stakeholders wrestle in a lot of depth with the question of how are we going to go about carrying out truly rigorous integration of multiple data sources as a way of moving beyond traditional sample surveys as such. And I believe a useful framework for trying to understand this is to say, let's think about the overall arching goals that we have for transparency and reproducibility, and possibly replicability to some degree. Think about focusing that in a way that says, let's go back and think in depth about the performance profile vector, quality, risk, and cost components. 
think about those as being a function both of environmental characteristics and also design characteristics and the underlying properties of that model fit. Thank you.